Good morning. In your song books, the red song books you have, the uh, preview that we're going to play is song number 700. One of our older tunes that the Army has had for us quite a number of years. And it's talking about uh, the Lord's command go into the world. And on we march with the blood and fire. So if you'd like to follow the words, it's number 700 in the uh, song books that you have in the pew. this time to be able to meet in this space 
to be able to join our voices together as one voice, to be able to share fellowship, join our hearts together as one heart. And Father, we give you thanks that when we come together like that, you promise that as we seek your face that we would indeed find you if we seek you with all our heart. And so this day we come seeking. Father, we thank you for your many benefits to us. We thank you, God, that you are indeed the one who continues to guard and to guide. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? So, Father, this day we come again in the security and of this sanctuary. And Father, we come in the security and the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, as we form this sanctuary of praise again this day, Father, may your heart be gladdened. May our spirits be empowered. And Father, may your name be praised. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, just before we share in singing our first uh, song, just a few, well, it seems like we have a lot of announcements, but there's some announcements for today. Uh, you would have received the bulletin, so many of them are in there as well. But just a reminder that Messy Church is this week, uh, Wednesday at 5 p.m. with a pancake supper, and we're going to have a few special guests. We're going to have a parrot, I understand, and a bunny, and a dog. So I think it's going to be a great night as we share together. Uh, also, you see in the bulletin that uh, Barb Cater is looking for volunteers. Well, I guess she's not necessarily, but uh, <laughs> uh, for the Meals on Wheels program. So if you're able to help out, you can talk to her. That's on Monday mornings. and just requires a couple of hours to help deliver meals. So if you're uh, interested in uh, helping out that way, please talk to Barb about that. Um, also, there, we are, will be doing a March break VBS two-day March break VBS program. Uh, that's going to be on the Tuesday and Wednesday of March break. So there is uh, applications for that. And if you know of anybody that might be interested in that, we can get more information about that in, in the next couple of weeks. Also, there's a men's breakfast this Saturday, um, February 25th. That's at 8.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Also, uh, you'll see in the bulletin and on the table in the foyer, there's a sign-up sheet for the coldest night of the year. So this is a fundraiser, and the funds this year are going to the Grace Inn Shelter. Uh, so there are a few of us that are already um, signed up to register to do the coldest night of the year are walk. Are still in the lead? It's a walk. Yes, our team is in the lead. We've joined forces with the, the Tweed Presbyterian Church. And we've formed one team, so our team is currently in the lead for all of Belleville, so we're happy about that. Um, so there are a few of us that are going to be uh, in that, but if you're interested or you think you might want to sponsor, uh, Julie, I believe, or, and Geraldine, and Curtis and myself, that's all I know so far that have signed up, um, but there is uh, information about that. You can talk to Julie if you need any more information. Also, uh, lastly, Ladies' Night Out is going to be on Saturday, March 18th. That's also in the bulletin. That's at 7 p.m. And it's going to be uh, a paint night. Now, you don't need to be afraid when you hear those words. It's my sister doing it, and if I can do it, anyone can do it. It's not going to be difficult. Trust me. And you've been requested to bring uh, some colorful pictures from a magazine. Now, you don't need to worry about that either. I'm sure that we, there will be, we only need a little bit each, and we're all going to, we're just going to be tearing them up and putting them on our picture. So it doesn't really matter what it looks like, it has some color in it, and I think it will be a great night. And if you don't have any, I'm sure there will be lots that we can choose from. I can bring some along as well. Well, not your magazines, I guess, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh, 393 in your songbook, if you'd like to stand together as we sing, and we'll sing the first two verses of the so you've heard the joyful sermon. <laughs> Thank you. 
Jesus saves. By his death and endless life, Jesus saves. Shout it brightly through the gloom, when the heart for mercy craves, sing in triumph o'er the tomb, Jesus saves. Let's sing the last verse together, verse 4 together. From the
pray. <laughs> Gracious God, we do indeed desire to come this day to this place of worship, not this, just this geographical place, this place within our own spirit, to set aside this quiet space, untroubled by the things that trouble our lives, and to rest upon the assurance that you are the God who comes to us, the God who intercedes for us, the God who knows all about us. And so, Father, this day we come. And Father, there are sometimes we come and feeling that we are not robed appropriately. Maybe there are those this day that would come and feeling that they only have grief to bring. Come, just as you are, to worship. Sometimes we feel there is disappointment as we come, and yet, just as we are, we come. Father, there are discouragements and there are concerns of health and body and mind, and yet we come, just as we are, broken and loved, we come. So, Father, this day, as we join our hearts and lives together here, with the desire to worship you, Father, we pray that you would indeed receive us, just as we are, that you would instruct our hearts and minds toward you, so that we might be able to accept our own acceptance by you, to rejoice in the fact that in our brokenness that we have been mended to the very heart of God. You have come and have received us, your beautiful, broken children. Father, we ask for your grace this day to for our city and for all of those who are gathered, Father, to join voice to voice and heart to heart this day in praise of your name. Father, we know they are brothers and sisters of us. Father, we covet them and we ask that you would indeed empower your people this day, that you would meet their need according to your riches and glory, and cause us all to continue to be agents of grace throughout your world. Father, your world that is so beautiful and so broken. But Father, this day again, we petition heaven on behalf of your world, the world that you loved, the world that you died for, for the cities of the world, the cities that you weep for. Father, stir our hearts as the world has stirred yours. Help us to respond, Father, in that self-sacrificial giving, that outpouring of love and concern, that action that speaks about the kingdom of God. Father, mend your world this day, and where possible, use us. Father, where possible, allow us to become the answer to our prayers. Guide your people, in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <coughs>
you so much to the worship team this morning for that ministry to the people of God. God's grace to you. This time we're going to hear the scripture reading. We're going to invite Josh, if he went, to come and to share with us this morning. Bless you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 10 today, so I hope that you enjoy it. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. The priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, <coughs> pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert on the law replied, the one who had mercy on me. Jesus told him, go and do like this. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for sharing the scripture reading for us today. I'm going to invite Jack and Sam to come for the offering, the offering for us for this morning. And just as they're coming, as we were singing that song, I believe that was one of the that choice that we sang that last song, uh, Here I Am, Lord, I Have Heard You Calling, and I Will Go. Beautiful song, and I believe that was the choice of Emily today. So we thank you for choosing that. It's beautiful words, and I encourage, well, all of us, but especially the young people today, I know it's not easy as you go to school from day to day uh, to be that example for God, but I encourage you to continue to do that and say, Here I Am, Lord. Um, and you can use me, and I will go for you. And just to be that light and that shining example in your school and in your community and in your family. So let's pray before we share and sing again. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you that we can share in this place together, and that we can worship you, and that we can praise you here. And today, as this offering has been brought, the tithes and offering before you this day, we thank you for them, and we pray that as we continue to serve you in our community, that uh, the monies will be put to good use to further your kingdom. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. And we're going to sing now uh, this little light of mine, and we're going to sing it through once, and then as we sing it through the second time, the young people can make their way to Sunday school.
us pray. Father God, we thank you for the ministry that you have indeed given each and every one of us. To be a light where we are in the world. You have named us that and called us those lights, those candles, set to, so that it gives light to everyone in the house. Father, we pray that we will continue to be that beacon of hope and light to your world. Thank you, Father, that you have not left us without instruction, but that you have given us of your spirit. You have given us of the fellowship of the saints. And Father, you have given us of the scriptures, that amazing record that has been so graciously left for us. We pray now that as we again reflect on its teaching, that you, by your spirit, would indeed be our interpreter, instructing these things through our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2? No, 10. <laughs> chapter 2, that was Christmas. Flashback. Luke chapter 10. Um, that's mentioned last week. This is one of those chapters in the scriptures. Um, and it, it's a real time, a real turning point as well. The ideas about discipleship, chapter 10 is all about that. And so the idea of the, it, it begins with Jesus sending out the 70 or the 72, depending on the translation you have. And, and they going out and ministering in Jesus' name. And then coming back and giving the reward. And then Jesus overwhelmed. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And Jesus does his happy dance. Remember that? That was last week. We're catching up now. The flashback has happened, but we're catching up. And so Jesus, that dancing before the light, praise you, Father, heaven of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise of the learned, and you have made them known to children. And so today we come, uh, well, actually, at the end of that, then, Jesus kind of takes the disciples aside privately and says to them, uh, kings and prophets long to see what you see and didn't see it. They long to hear what you hear, but they did not hear it. And right following that, we have this story here that Josh read for us this morning. This idea, this, this familiar, this uh, uh, one of those stories of people who don't know where it's found in the Bible, people who don't even know what's in the Bible, know this story of the Good Samaritan. It's one of those stories that is part of culture of the world. Um, it's a reference that people make, this idea of the Good Samaritan. It's interesting to know that uh, nowhere in the story is he called good. <laughs> Just that, that little caption that somebody else put there, but um, there, there's, no, there's no bad or good listed in the story. We're, we're asked to figure it out ourselves. And this story, uh, these ideas of discipleship from, uh, you know, we got the Good Samaritan, and then we have, following that, we have the story of Martha and Mary. Remember that? And so the Good Samaritan, Martha and Mary, Jesus is at their house, and Mary is sitting down and, and just taking in the teaching, and Martha is in the kitchen, busy with many things. You got company coming? Busy with many things. You understand that, right? Everybody knows Martha's position, knows that has to happen, right? Got to happen. And yet, in the two stories, actually in the story of the Good Samaritan, we're told to go and do. And then in the story of Martha and Mary, we're told to sit and listen. Go and do, sit and listen. Go and do, sit and listen. Like, you know, what are we, you know, which one, which discipleship uh, action are we to take? Are we to go and do or sit and listen? These things, as we go through the text here, maybe, um, and I'm going to approach it a little bit different this morning, in that as Jesus tells this story, and he never calls it a parable, by the way. We talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. He's not called a parable, nor is the Samaritan called good. I don't know where we pick that up. Somewhere along the line. But anyway, this story of uh, the Samaritan and other cast of characters. And so as we go through, like I said, maybe I'll, you might sense a little bit different... I hope what you get is that you sense like the ground might be shifting. Okay, like, you know, okay, I, I thought I was standing there, but I'm not standing there, I'm standing over here now. And, and because that's what Jesus does in the story. Jesus never tells us who's good, he never tells us who's bad, he allows us to figure it out. 
He asks the question back, who then is the neighbor? He allows us the input. He allows us the discernment. He allows us that, that uh, uh, you know, autonomy of choice of who we're going to follow in the story. Who's the neighbor? Word of God is not a, a static word. It's, it's not something that, that's uh, you know, kind of uh, etched in stone. Contrary to Moses. No. The, the, the scriptures tell us that the, the word of God is not etched in stone right there. Where is it etched? It is etched on the tablets of human hearts, the scripture tells us. It is written upon our hearts. On that fleshy, mushy, uh, feeling, compassionate, uh, responsive heart of people. That's where the law of God is written. Not on tablets of stone, not on some static thing that we point back and say, it's right there, see it, right there. It's written upon the tablets of a human heart. So we come to this text today. Anybody, uh, I have such a, you know, the, the text in the back there. Could you get Waldo? Where's Waldo? Can you get him up for me? Where's Waldo? Anybody see these books? Yeah? You sit there and puzzle over this all, you know, like, and apparently, like that intrepid, uh, uh, you know, adventurer, he's up there somewhere. He's always somewhere in the store, in the picture. And there's sometimes that, uh, you know, you might swear up and down that he's needed. he's not on this page, okay? He is not on this page. And yet, where's Waldo? We're going to kind of play where's Waldo or have that kind of little, um, yeah, little reference in the back of our minds as we go through this morning. So we're looking for this Waldo. Looking, where do we stand? Where is it? And you'll notice something. He's never on the same place on the next page, right? You found him top right-hand corner, right? Got him right there. But no, he's not there this time. You know, he's somewhere else in the mix. Here's Paul. Look for Billy Jordan. Everybody's seen this, right? I'm not using a reference that's on the East Coast. No, that's different than Hind Crap before, apparently. All week, I've been putting out, you know, uh, you know, Answer. So what was that again? <laughs> Heiner part. Okay. But Jesus, in telling the story here, he introduces a cast of characters. He introduces this concise, beautiful story told. And he introduces, a, like I say, a cast of characters. And he never, ever tells us who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad. We have, like, we're, we're in the story somewhere. We're asked to find ourselves. Where is Walla? We're asked to find ourselves in the story. And when he comes to the end of it, and, and so we can't treat this like some morality tale, and, and you know, when you get to the end, and it means this. Or like something from Mother Goose, some, or Aesop's fables, right? Like these ideas, the moral of the story is. Jesus doesn't let us off that easy. He asks us, asks us to reciprocate that. He asks us to fill in the end of the story. He doesn't tell us what the end is. He says, how do you read it? What is the right answer? <clears throat> and so we got this cast of characters. The first ones that come along in the story, of, not just the first ones, I'm just going to pick out a few at random, because I'm going to allow a couple of the people in the story, just for your own good pleasure this afternoon, when you got nothing else to do, and just go through the story again. And figure out the other cast of characters. The priest and the Levite. Right? They come out to the, you know, they walk onto the stage and everybody goes, boo, boo. Because we're taught, like, you know, in the church, we're taught, okay, we know they're bad, right? Jesus never says that. Jesus never says that in the story. And these, the, these people who we boo, you know something? They are the highest moral living people on the planet. These are people who have trained themselves to memorize all of the Old Testament. To memory. I don't even know my cell number. <laughs> I always have to pause and make sure I get it right. They memorize all of They are the most disciplined, the most pious people on the planet. And here they come, and they walk by, the priest goes by, sees the man, and walks by on the other side. The Levite, this, this high, lofty calling of God, and he walks by. You see, these are people who are not angry at God. These are people who want to serve God and have committed themselves to doing it. Have 
committed their lives to doing it. What a shocker it must have been for the people to, you know, the first century people to hear this story. What was it? Now, remember uh, the Apostle Paul? I mean, Paul, when he was Saul, before that whole transformation took place, he wasn't, an, he didn't see himself as an enemy of God. He saw himself as doing God's will. He was out there doing God's will until God confronted him and knocked him off his high horse. And then he began like, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus who you persecute. That kind of twisting, that kind of uh, uh, head snap, that kind of repentance, turning around the very thing that we thought was the way to go. Paul said, okay, I thought I was doing the right thing, but he was actually doing the wrong thing. Wow, what a jolt that must have been. But here we have these, the priests and the Levites, and the thing with them though, where is it that they, they kind of, uh, they pass by? How is it that they allow themselves to do this? How is it that they can allow them? You see, their position allows them to do that. It is their position. It is the high lofty calling that they have. It is the expectation that others have of them. And they say, well, like if we're seen with this person, if we touch this person, we don't know this person, and we're going to be ceremonially unclean, well, we could be setting ourselves up to be the victims of the robbers who are hiding in the rocks here somewhere. You see, these were people, we talk about all the laws they had, but the ideas of all the laws, the 629 of them, I'm glad I don't have to remember all them either. But the reason, they were, to, they were as hedges, they were walls around the law itself. They were walls around the Ten Commandments. They said, okay, do not do this. And then they said, well, we can't leave it just kind of sitting right there like that. We've got to put another commandment in front of it so that people won't even get to approach the law. They said, so now you can't do this. They made that a law. And then they said, well, that's still pretty close. It's right next door to the law. Right? And then they made another law. And another law. They had 10 commandments. They had 629 laws. What were they there to do? To protect the law. I've used this illustration before. Don't touch this. It's for homely. Right? So mom says, don't touch it. It's for homely. And what does she do? She'll take the cookies and put them in the tin. Don't touch them. None are for homely. And then she said, I don't know if you're just safe sitting right there on the counter, though. So she takes them and she puts them in the cupboard. Now, don't go in that cupboard. Now it's against the law to even go in the cupboard. Right? And this is how they built up the 629 laws. They were passionate about the law of God. And yet, how could they walk by? How could they walk by? These were two people who were not ethically dead. These were two professionals who were not void of human compassion. How could they walk by? They became <coughs> law keepers and not people keepers. They became law keepers and not people keepers. Even the worship time itself had become a burden for people. They were wondering, am I walking too far? Am I carrying too much? Is this work now? Is somebody going to tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, you have transgressed the law now. And Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man, but the Sabbath. You are the icon of God, the very image of God. There is nothing else in the world that is the image of God. Not the Bible, not the Ten Commandments, not the Torah, not all of Scripture, not anything else in all of creation. Who is the image of God? He only created mankind in His image. Male and female, He made them. You are the image of God in the world. Jesus comes back to redeem the image of God in us. Not to establish a new law, but to redeem those whom the law was supposed to help and to heal. We have somebody else in the story. Robbers. There's robbers in the story. 
Where's Waldo? I don't know where I am in the story. Maybe I'm the robber. We never picture that. We never picture ourselves there. Well, notice that we're never that one. Not the robbers. Can't be that one. These robbers who who beat this poor unfortunate Waldo, this traveler. They take all that he has. They steal everything he had, and they left him bleeding in the ditch, half dead. I'm not sure which half, but half dead. <laughs> it doesn't go on to say which half. <laughs> Say, surely not us. Wouldn't be us. Not us. This, this idea of robbers in the story. Let's see. No. But let's stand there for a bit. Let's stand right there for a bit. We're the robbers. I'm sure we had a different picture of ourselves than that, but let's stand there just just for fun. As people in the global north, if you were to stand in the global south, if you were to stand in, in places that are so impoverished, and to look at the global north, or what they call uh, the western civil, but I uh, read a book a while ago, or an article in the book that says uh, the rest in the west. <laughs> <laughs> the West and the rest, right? Like Western, the, someone has put it together. I'm not sure how they, you know, what kind of a, a, a algorithm they use for this. But they said, if everybody in the world lived like the people in North America live, with the opulence that we have, with the resources that we squander, we would need four planet Earths to live on. <laughs> to have enough resources for everybody to live like we do in North America. I don't know where that comes from, as far as who counted it. But the thing is, the rest look at the West. And they see the opulence. They see how, how you know, uh, and we say, oh, we're blessed of God. Yes. After we've enslaved, after we've taken land, after we've uh, robbed the global south to build uh, chapels and cathedrals and palaces in the global north. And then sometimes we go all Steve Urkel and say, did I do that? <laughs> With me? Did I do that? Have we benefited from that? Maybe we're not the robbers. Maybe we're the ones who, when the robber gets back and says, see, look what I got. Ask the people in the Congo who, who are you know, living on less than $2 a day so that they might get a, a particular ore out of the ground so that we can have our cell phones that I can't remember the number to. Right? They're, 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 they're digging holes in their floors trying to find something extra trying to find some more of this mineral so that we can have more cell phones and laptops and tablets. Are they benefiting from that? Hmm. Who's the robber in the story? The one who takes the resources and leaves the infrastructure there pathetic, no health care in many, many regions. But we got our phones. We got healthy thumbs. Maybe to stand uh, with the, the fishermen on the, the shores of uh, Nigeria and look at uh, the big platforms, oil platforms, right there in the shallows. BP, Shell, name the others. Makes no difference. And all the fish that used to be there that they could catch with their cast nets and sell in the local markets. They're not there at all. Nor do they have jobs on these big oil platforms. But who's the robber there? The one who steals, the one who benefits from the theft. We had the opportunity to spend the vast majority of our officership actually within First Peoples Community in Canada to stand there as the only person that's not Aboriginal and the one who preaches about the theft 
The, the, the big joke in, uh, in uh, you know, First Nations country is, uh, yeah, the missionaries showed up and they told us, uh, bow your heads, close your eyes, and then they took our land. <laughs> Go to a hockey game here, we acknowledge the fact we stand on Haudenosaunee territory. Who's the robbers if you stood out there? Who's the robbers when uh, you know a delegation from Canada, from some friends of ours from Northern British Columbia, just a couple of months ago were in Scotland, in Edinburgh, at the museum, trying to get some stuff that was... You ever see the show Stuff the British Stole? <laughs> stuff the British Stole! <laughs> They took it, they said, okay, now this is pagan, and this is heathen, and this is all of this. Had no understanding of what a totem pole was. They saw the thing down. Where'd they put it? Took it to Scotland. Erected it in a museum. People went over and he looked at it and said, that's our pole. He said, yeah, we know. So he'd like to have it back. Uh, no, nope. we're not finished looking at it yet. <laughs> that's all they're doing, they're looking at it. Depending on where you stand, right? Where you stand. Maybe in the story, maybe the guy in the ditch, maybe that's Jesus. We talked a little bit about that. Jesus in the ditch. What? If you look at this story, who's the guy that's there fallen? The nameless one. The one who's beaten. Because he already tried to do this to him. And Jesus says to us, in as much as you, like when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And, and so, it, it, could it be the Christ? The guy in the ditch? Where do we stand in the story then? What role do we have then? Or maybe Christ is the Samaritan. Maybe Christ would look at him and say, well, he's a Samaritan. He's the one who comes along, who takes the chance on us, who risks everything so that he might come and kneel down and mend us and soothe our wounds and heal us from all that is beaten upon us by the enemy. Maybe it's him. And, and then he takes us and he says, I will meet your needs according to my riches in glory. And then he says, and when I come back, I'm going to set all matters right. Is Jesus the Samaritan in the story? But maybe the story is not about robbers or priests and Levites. Maybe it's not even about Samaritans and Poor sods in a ditch. Maybe, maybe we're asked to see ourselves as the lawyer in the story. The lawyer in the story. The teacher of the law. The one who goes to the temple more than most. The one who uh, loves to hear a good biblical sermon more than most. The one who reads the scroll more than most. Maybe, maybe we're asked to see ourselves there. The lawyer comes with his questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And he's a good lawyer. You know that, right? You know, he's a, you know how I know he's a good lawyer? Because he knew the answer to the question before he ever asked it. That's number one in law, you're Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> Never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. He already knew the answer. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, how do you read it? And then he goes off and quotes the scriptures. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor yourself. And he, you know, this, Jesus, right answer. He got it right. Yeah, and, and so then he comes down, and who is my neighbor? <clears throat> and then at the end of the story, he says, Jesus gives him his own answer or his own question back. You notice that Jesus always answers a question with a question. Drives me bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, who was the one who proved to be the neighbor? And then he answered correctly again. The one who had mercy. The one who had mercy. He knows the answers. So what's wrong with right answers? Because in the story, we never get the feeling that the lawyer is in the right. Why is that? Has he got right answers, wrong motive? You notice that? He asks the question, the one who goes to church more than most, the one who knows the scriptures more than most, the one who likes the good biblical sermon more than most, and he asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Already knowing the answer, already knowing what the answer was. 
And so we have this person now in confronting the Christ here with this. And the reason he's doing it is to test him. Trying to trip him up in his words. Trying to give him an uh, opportunity to, to say something so that he can use it back against him. It's to test the Christ. And then the second question he asks, what are we told about that? In order to justify himself, he asks another question, who then is my neighbor? To justify himself. <coughs> See, we can have all the right answers. But the ideas are around the kingdom of God, the ideas around this, who's participating in that, who are the disciples, the Marys and the Marthas, who are the disciples in the story of the Samaritan, the ones who go and do, and the ones who sit and listen. But the thing is, motive matters. Motive matters in the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not identified, and the people of the kingdom are not identified by how many right answers we have. And lots of times we have answers to questions that nobody's asking. But the kingdom of God is not about having all the right answers. The kingdom of God is about showing compassion and love to the people you come into contact with. Actually, Jesus turns the story around, or turns the question around, and he asks him, the man says, now, who is my neighbor? And Jesus asks, who, who proved himself a neighbor? Who was the neighbor? Who are we in the story? Who was the one who was the neighbor? To act neighborly. The kingdom of God is anti-Lego in the world. It doesn't fit. And membership into the kingdom of God, as Jesus indicates for us in this story, is not about ancestry. And it's not about having the right answers. It's about the compassion, the following after the Christ. Right attitude trumps right answers. Let this attitude be in you, Paul says, which was also in Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. And he humbled himself. Where's Waldo? Where do we find ourselves in the story? Where do we find ourselves in this community? Waldo, actually his name, it means law or rule, authority, Waldo, authority. So where does our authority come from? All our right answers for the fact that we kneel by the side of the road and minister to the ones who have fell among robbers and speak God's grace and embody God's word to them there. The right answers, kingdom of God is not about the right answers shouted from the pulpit or the housetops from positions of power. The kingdom of God is about an attitude of service to God's beautiful, broken world. And I'd like to worship to you or to come. I'm going to join in singing a familiar song, I hope. I know it's familiar to some. Servant song.
Father God, we do indeed ask for those opportunities again to share as family, your family, in your world. Father, we thank you for the many ways that you give us opportunities for the service that is rendered from this core. Father, I ask you to continue to bless the efforts of those who give of themselves, who pour out of themselves each and every week in ministry to your world. And Father, we ask that we would continue to seek to find ourselves, to find ourselves as the servant of God in whatsoever situation, to find ourselves there as the ministers of grace. Find ourselves there, sometimes maybe conflicted by many things, but allowing grace, allowing compassion to be our first response. Guide us, we pray, as we continue to seek to be your children in your world. Amen. We're going to share in singing for our closing song, God is with us. It's number 158 in the songbook. If you'd like to follow along, where the words will be on the screen. God is with us, so our brave forefathers sang, far across the field of battle, loud their holy war cry rang. Never once they feared nor faltered, never once they ceased to sing, God is with us. I'll invite you to stand together as we sing, and we'll sing verses 1 and 2 together.
somebody else's birthday, but I won't say anything about it. Let's sing together. This, this is the God we adore.